Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guests are Nick Sinko and Doug Ebaugh. They'll be speaking about uh, Nick's apostolate careers through faith. So if you're out there, you're looking for a job, we're going to be speaking about those kind of issues, how to discern your gifts and talents, how to put them in the service of the Lord, and also practical aspects, you know, about finding work. Um, we also have this weekend uh, the family celebration. It's here in Birmingham at the, at the uh, Civic Center here in Birmingham, and it's uh, loaded with great speakers. We have Father Benedict Groeschel, Father Mitch Pacwa, Raymond Arroyo, Johnette, uh, Father Frank Pavone, and Janet Morena, and Marcus. So we'll have panels and different talks being given. So I want to invite everybody to Birmingham this weekend uh, for the family celebration. Those are always a great blessing for us to meet the people who who actually watch. And Doug, you wanted to um, ask for prayers, right? For well, yeah, I, I just don't want us to forget, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, here we are in the, the, the heat of the summer and uh, I'm from Nebraska and we have just uh, endured a week long um, heat wave that's been pretty, pretty difficult for a lot of people. And it's covered a lot of states in the Midwest, a lot of states in the country, but the Midwest really got hit hard recently and still going on for some. Just gotta remember to pray for, uh, for the people suffering and struggling. Uh, with a lot of the disasters. We can't forget the prayers going out for those people who are still recovering from the tornadoes uh, down here in Alabama, in the south, uh, Joplin, Missouri. I mean, some very devastating situations that, remember, when it's out of sight, it's out of mind. And because we're not seeing it in the press and in the news a lot, doesn't mean that these people aren't still grieving the loss of loved ones. They're still rebuilding their homes. There's a lot of cleanup still going on, a lot of rebuilding going on of structures. Uh, so let's not forget to pray for those people. Pray for the people enduring the heat wave. Pray for the flood victims. We got the Missouri River still, uh, still, still creating a lot of problems for a lot of people right now. We cannot forget this. We are, we are all in this world to help one another, pray for one another. So I really want to plead, uh, plead with all of you out there to not forget the prayers for the people that are that are, that are having very difficult times uh, this year with uh, with disasters. It's a, it's a tough time for a lot of people. And you can speak to that because you're from. Nebraska. I live in Nebraska. Yeah, we hear it constantly what's going on. You know, we're not that far from the Missouri. It's right there. In fact, when I fly back into Omaha on a regular basis, uh, you know, the water is right up against the levee right by the airport. Mm -hmm. That thing goes up a little, a little more and then, the, you know, the yeah, engineers are yeah. concerned. Is it weakening the levee? Uh, they've got sandbags around the transformers around the airport. So, uh, you know, this is something that we can't uh, take for granted, take lightly. Okay. And we also have World Youth Day quickly approaching, uh, less than a, a month away. And, uh, and as you know, we are World Youth Day Central. Tonight on the line we have Francesco Cesoreo. He's the president of Assumption College in Worcester, Massachusetts. He's going to speak to us about uh, our Holy Father, his thinking, and his messages to, to young people. Uh, Dr. Francesco, are you there? Yes, I am. Pleasure to be with you. Oh, uh, great. We're glad to have you here. Now, you've studied his work, his writings, our Holy Fathers. Uh, can you can you talk about the theme of this World Youth Day? Sure. I, I think um, that the Holy Father is going to use this World Youth Day as an opportunity to help young people to rediscover their Christian commitment and their Christian faith, you know, and to contextualize it within the context of his consistent message that the people of Europe in particular cannot forget their Christian roots. Right. And... What do you think uh, some of his, his themes that resonate with young people, that common themes that he'll, he'll use? I think number one is the importance of strengthening their faith and recognizing that the faith is an alternative to the culture of relativism that is bombarding young people today and that the church is here to support them, to nourish them, and to provide them with that strength so that they become firmly rooted in the faith and become the future missionaries, if you will, evangelizers of the faith. I know a, a prominent theme we've often heard about World Youth Day is that it tries to foster an encounter with Jesus Christ. And you know, how do you do that with 
There's over a million people coming to this World Youth Day. Sure. How does that happen? Well, I think just the witness of all of these people coming together with one common purpose, and that common purpose is to celebrate the faith, to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the center of our lives. That in itself is a way to encounter Christ. And the catechesis that takes place, each individual will himself or herself feel some connection in that process. And I've noticed, you know, going to several World Youth Days, just the travel, the journey there, it has a way of, of helping you to let go of the old and embrace something new, and you know, maybe welcoming Jesus into your life in a new way. Oh, absolutely, because what it does is allow you the, the opportunity to encounter Christ with all of those who are there with you. And that journey is really the journey to the Father. And I think that's really important as an experience of World Youth Day. You know, one thing I, I appreciate about our, our Holy Father is that you know, he can be fairly critical of the culture and the relativism, as you mentioned. Can you think of some of the ways that he does warn our young people what to look out for, what to be aware of in this culture? Sure. I think uh, the whole notion that we can live a fully happy life without God in our, in our lives, and that we, we have a culture that it tries to marginalize faith, tries to marginalize religion. I think that's one element. Another element that I think he tries to help the young people understand is that we hear a lot of people talk about that they're spiritual or that they're, they're living a, a, a spiritual life, but divorced from an institutional faith. And the Holy Father tries to remind the young people that you have to be connected to the church, to this community of believers that brings you back 2,000 years, that sustains and nurtures you on this journey, and that you cannot sustain a meaningful faith life without being bound to the church. And I think that's another aspect that he tries to get across in, in this culture that we live in. Uh, now, Francesco, in, in the last couple of years, the Holy Father has made some pretty uh, serious statements regarding the world, the state of the world that we're in. Uh, back in December, he said to the Roman Curia that the future of the world is at stake. Uh, back in um, oh, 2009, he made the statement that uh, there are vast regions of the world where the faith is in danger of dying out like mm -hmm. a fire with no fuel. Uh, he has said some very serious things. Do you, do you see him choosing uh, Spain being, you know, traditionally so Catholic, uh, Europe obviously so rich with Catholicism, not just as a nice place for us to go to rediscover our roots, but really as a critical mission that we need to, because Europe is in very serious trouble, as is the rest of the world when it comes to the, the, the faith and the, the attacks on the faith around there. Do you see this being a very serious approach as well? Oh, absolutely. I, I, don't, I think that going to Madrid, going to Spain, not only because of its history uh, in terms of its connection with the church, but also recognizing that the time that we live in are ones that are very, very um, critical for the future of the church. And if we don't begin to combat this, this slippery slope where religion is almost non-existent in the West, and particularly in Europe, that the future of the church is at stake. And so coming to Madrid and holding World Youth Day there is a message to the people of Europe in particular. Mm. Mm. And could you tell us about the school you're at, uh, Dr. Cesare? Are you you're the president of Assumption yes, College? Yes, Assumption mm -hmm. College. We're a um, liberal arts college um, that is sponsored by the uh, Augustinians of the Assumption, the Assumptions, which were an order founded in France right after the French Revolution. And one of our real focuses here is the importance of the Catholic intellectual life and the Catholic intellectual tradition and that education is not only the education of the mind, but it also is the education of the heart and of the soul. And that, so spiritual formation is integral to this experience here at Assumption College. And students uh, or people can find out about our history and, and our commitment to our Catholic identity by going on our website, which is uh, www.assumption.edu. But we're a school that is not afraid to be Catholic, that we are explicit about our Catholic identity, and that's why we're taking uh, 18 students to World Youth Day, because we want to have them experience this and then come back to campus and bring the message to the students at the beginning of the new academic year. 
Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and uh, giving us some good words of wisdom. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with uh, Doug Ebaugh and Nick Sinko. So don't go away. We'll be talking about careers in the faith. So we'll be back in a minute. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guests are uh, Doug Eba and Nick Sinko. Welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Good to have you. Good to be here. Now we'll start uh, with you, Nick, about uh, careers through faith. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then we're going to go into greater depth throughout the show. But. Your careers through faith began uh, essentially with a phone call from our pastor, uh, Father Roger Prokoff at the time. He's passed on now. but. He had the wisdom to know that there were some things that he was very, very good at, but we were gonna build a community by relying upon the talents of everybody that was in the parish. And he had a series of people that were coming to him about you know, life problems that he often saw were job or career problems. And he asked me to work with him and others on his staff. And one person after another turned into a series of people. And then by the end of the year, we were doing classroom programs. So when you're a Parish priest calls, you never know what's ahead of you. And 20 mm -hmm. years now later, we're a global ministry. Right. Now let's connect this to our, our biblical faith. You speak oftentimes about the parable of the talents. Can you talk about that, how that introduces us to this topic? Sure. When we began the workshops, they were job or career search type of workshops, and they were fairly secular, but we always wanted to begin and end with prayer, and then of course, add some scripture to it. And then that's where God wove his way right into the middle of it because he kept introducing scripture to us that was directly applicable to the program. So it wasn't like the, the uh, scripture was the bread ends on it. It was the meat of the program. And one of the first scriptures that he brought to our mind was the parable of the talents. And it just had a major impact on the ministry. And as a matter of fact, whenever I can, I present a program, I always like to begin with reading that scripture. Mm -hmm. And you pointed out something interesting to me I didn't think about. Um, which is the, the steward that gets in trouble? Well, you know, everybody thinks it's the 10 or the five talent person that's gonna get in trouble. And I see quite a few people in the audience shaking their heads mm -hmm. saying, no, it's not. It's the one talent person that got in trouble. And, and interestingly, again, the genius of Jesus as a storyteller, he wanted to make sure that those of us that had minor talents, and I'll hold up my hand on that mm -hmm. one, feel like we're accountable for them. And he called him a wicked and lazy servant if he didn't use those talents. Right. Catches right. your attention. Right. And you also use some pretty strong language about using your talents in terms of a commandment, right? Well, yeah, you know, my mind is, one of the things that I bring to the table is, is I have a very creative mind. And my mind goes to, if, if there was an eighth sacrament, what would it be? If there was an 11th commandment, what would it be? And I'm just absolutely sure the more I read the parable of the talents, the 11th commandment might have been before the list was cut down to 10, thou shalt use thy talents. Right, right. And that, you think about that parable of the talents, I mean, that's in the Gospels, and it's a lengthy parable, and it comes up a lot in our readings and at the liturgy, so it's, it's very important. And it connects directly to the role of the laity, right? Because we are, in the beginning, Ad, Adam and Eve are created, they're given the garden, not just to uh, sit back and drink mint juleps or iced tea, right? <laughs> They're supposed to cultivate, the, even before the fall, they were to cultivate the garden. And that's the role of the laity, is to be out in that big bad world and change it, to claim it for Christ, to till and cultivate. And that means using your ingenuity, your creativity, your strength, uh, all of that. And Doug? Well, and that's one thing that I've, I've found interesting about the third servant, and, and I've given talks on this, it's called the third servant syndrome, mm -hmm. is that this guy didn't do anything bad. Correct. He didn't do anything evil in the sense of he didn't use what he was given to, to corrupt anybody. He wasn't out there you know, using like, like, a, like a Hollywood star doing foul movies or, or a rock star on the stage doing evil, nasty stuff or, or uh, <laughs> something to that effect. You know, he wasn't a drug dealer. Right. He just did nothing. And by doing nothing, that is where Christ uh, really gets on him and says, you did nothing with it, that alone. You knew I was a hard master. You knew I was strict. 
but you did nothing. Uh, you know, what, what does that say to us about just sitting lazy and apathetic? You know, lazy or apathetic or even undermining yourself and saying, God didn't give me much. Mm -hmm. And I just don't believe that there's a God that singles people out and said to him, I'm going to give a lot and to him, I'm going to give a little. I'm sure there are different talents from what I've seen that are distributed to people, but it doesn't exempt any of us. And, you know, and I, I have to tell you, I labored underneath that for the first 20, 25 years of my life. I grew up in a very poor section of a town outside of Chicago called Hammond, Indiana. And while I was there, I actually thought that, you know, I was never going to go anywhere because I grew up on Hickory Street. And Hickory Street meant something to me, that I didn't really have, you know, the blue, I had a very strong blue collar background, not a white collar background. Parents didn't belong to the country club, didn't go to the best of schools. Mm -hmm. And therefore I thought, you know, it's, I'm just probably not going to go anywhere. But when God gets a hold of you and starts working with you and telling you, I have a purpose for your life, and you get that into your heart and you begin to believe that maybe there is something out there, he takes that one talent person and he begins to move them. And that's why we call the ministry careers through faith rather than the opposite, which is careers through fear. Because so many people are managing their life through fear that they don't have what it takes. Mm. Faith says, God will give me whatever I need and it's just totally different. Now let's also bring Doug into this uh, discussion. You're not just to sit here and look good, right? You have a great story. <laughs> I met you at uh, Jill, our producer, uh, Jill Copeland, uh, her wedding. Uh, can we talk, start with your story? Yeah, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I met Nick actually on a referral. I was in a situation where I actually was looking for some help to take a serious look and say, okay, God, now if you had a career in mind for me, where would that be and, and, and what would it be doing? And I'll just have to backtrack a little bit. Um, back in 2005, I graduated from a state school in the Midwest with a degree in chemical engineering. And when I went there, I, I, I just wanted to be a chemical engineer because of the challenge. I like challenges. I like, I like creati creative challenges. Well, when I was working with him, one of the things I asked him was, why did you pick chemical engineering? And he said, because it was the most difficult thing on campus. Yeah. You know? <laughs> There's really no rhyme or reason for <laughs> it's that. It's just like, yeah, uh -huh. let's try it. But I did, I did have an interest in math and science. So there was a little bit, it had some of that going. For me, and so after a, a series of, uh, of uh, job changes, I was working as a biotech engineer near Washington D.C., and there I met the love of my life, and I wanted to buy a ring, pay for the wedding, and all the financial things that come with this because I really wasn't making that much money. D.C. is a very expensive area of the country to live, so um, I uh, did what every natural person would do and that's you know start you know getting in contact networking uh, getting in contact with all your uh, people who are out there in the business world start applying to jobs in you know chemical engineering positions and looking for companies who hire chemical engineers and then once I find those jobs spruce up my resume bait the hook to suit the fish so to speak and apply to those jobs and so I was looking for things in in the realm that I went to school for again that I decided to go to school to be a chemical engineer just because it was really challenging. So uh, long story short, I ended up uh, taking a position at a nuclear power plant. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it, all, all, nuclear power plants, they, 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 this applies to chemical engineering because they all have chemistry departments. And so I, I, I took a job working in the chemistry department, which was, it, from the world's perspective, it was a good fit because, you know, it was technical, it, there was chemistry and math involved. Um, it was a great paying job. It which had a was, secure future to it. Very it had secure something future. you were looking at as you were getting married. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm seeing the... Except the, for the occasional meltdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, security exactly. is relative, you know. It, yes. Yeah, okay. it, exactly. That, it, that is unfortunate. I mean, we see in Japan that, yeah, that, yeah, that sort of thing. Tough moment. Exactly. Very that tough. can happen. Yeah. But... Um, you know, I saw the uh, bling, 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 all the dollar signs here going up. I'm thinking, this is great. I'm going to be a great provider for my wife and the family, and everything is set. Well, shortly after beginning the job, I started to get the sense that something isn't right here. This is just not right. And uh, at the and we should be clear, it is and. It, it was and is a great job. There is nothing wrong with the facility, the company, the industry, anything. It's just yes. a power, powerful. Gee, did I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great place to work. Yes. 
Yes, it was. It's it's a great place to work for somebody who that's a good fit for. For me, however, um, I, I began to really struggle. Um, it got to the point where, um, you know, I almost, and I'll be honest, I became the la laughing stop of the group that I was working with. Not because I was a bad person, but because I kept, you know, making mistakes. And I was like, gosh, okay, I need to work harder, focus more. Well, then managers started looking at me and saying, hey, you're making a lot of mistakes here. Let me show you this pyramid. The more mistakes you make down here lead to, you know, up here to this big catastrophe that could happen. And, and, and like, I'm thinking, oh, no. Like I'm a meltdown. A, like a meltdown. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Right. Obviously. Yeah. You have disaster in your mind today, don't you? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, yeah, as you said, these are powerful problems. Yes. <laughs> But a nuclear power plant. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, there, there, it was a serious situation, though, because here I am engaged with the love of my life, and I'm, I want to be that great husband and provider for my wife and family, and, and I, I wanted to do well at my job. And it seemed like no matter how, how much harder I worked and how much I tried to focus, it just wasn't working. Doug, let's tell them what you did. As soon as you graduated with your engineering degree, what did you do? Oh, uh, I, yeah, I, I went to California to try to become a rock star. He's an outstanding musician. He's a poet. He's a songwriter. And later in the show, you'll get to hear some of his music. He's really, really gifted. You know, somebody that graduates with an engineering degree doesn't really go off to California and join a rock band. Mm -hmm. He did. <laughs> And you know he had the, the, the that's, there's a conversion element to this too. We're gonna yes. In a second. <laughs> yes. 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 We'll second definitely thing. get to the conversion. So element. now here, here we're going to tie this together for you. Yes. Do you really want a rock star in a nuclear power plant? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you see it coming? Well, considering the disaster element, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah. Pyrotechnics on a much larger scale. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mushroom cloud style. Yes. He, he did yeah. play on the stage. We talked about that, didn't yeah. he, with the flames and the yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. It just it, it just really wasn't a good fit. But you know, I honestly had never taken a serious look at. Okay, you know, I'm I'm a believer in Christ. I'm a believer in God. I believe that He created us all individually with our own unique talents and abilities. But I never stopped to step back and say, Hey, God, who did you create in me? You know, and and really reflect on that, and 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 wood, do some woodshedding and and figure this out. Um, you know, in college, when I went to college, and, and all of you, seriously, listen up to this, because one day <laughs> you're going to be faced with this here, okay? You, you, I never really looked and said, okay, God, where, where would you like me to go to school? Based on my talents and who you created me to be and my passions, what is a good career for me? And, and I was stuck after graduating and having, you know, this almost, you know, borderline failure. Um, Excuse me. This this borderline uh, this borderline failure. Then oh, I was going back. Melt, meltdown. A meltdown. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Then let's I was stick with the theme. Here. Let's, let's yeah. stay with this, right? <laughs> then I was going back and asking myself, okay, God, what sh where should I go? What career do you have in mind? Shouldn't I've been asking that before I went to college and in selecting my degree rather than just, you know, I'll choose the hardest one on the curriculum here. And that's yeah. where Doug got serious about this yeah. and said, you know, we need to take a deeper look at this. Yes. And, See, well, and that's a struggle for me too because, you know, I give a lot of talks to young people around the country and have for many years and I find a lot of them, you know, they're going to graduate from high school and the question is always put to them, what school are you going to go to now? And I, my question has always been to them, are you, are you talking to God about where he wants you to go now? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, because, because a lot of our young people are in college, they're spinning their wheels in the mud, they're racking up debt like crazy, and there's a good number of them who don't know what they're doing, what they want to do, but they're doing it because it's kind of the cookie cutter approach, we just go this route, rather than I know as you guys are getting at, we need to be deeply in prayer asking God, with what you've given me, Lord, where do I go? But parents, we, we've got to be asking our kids this. This has got to be the challenge put out to our young people is talk to God to find out what he wants you to do before you get into situations where you're just spinning your wheels. And then also work with somebody else. By no means am I suggesting it's me or our ministry. It could be anyone, but work with someone else that will take the time mm -hmm. to walk you through a process and that let that person tell their story because it, it's in the storytelling, mm -hmm. not necessarily in a career test that you will see the answers. And I, I get emails from people that are lost, and I've gotten a couple this week, and they're heart-wrenching, and they don't know what to do. And my answer is always, get help. God never meant us to go through the difficult times of our life alone. Mm. Seek help. 
we got to take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back in a minute with Doug Ebaugh and uh, Nick Senko. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. Uh, Doug, I'd like to pick up on your story, and we can talk about how you met Nick, and also maybe the practical things mm -hmm. uh, that you all did together. Yeah, Nick has 100 plus career transition tips. It's actually a book as part of his program that he incorporates. It's very methodical, it's step by step. It's, uh, a, it's a guide to get you from point A to point B, and, um, you know, tell a little more. You know, anything worth doing is worth doing well, and you know, there is certain uh, amount of spontaneity in these conversations, but there's also a process that you find that's necessary to walk people through from I don't know to I do know, and I know God is behind this. And you know, these are process steps, and you know, for example, the very first step in the book isn't get started, or what's your goal, or your objective. The very first tip is stop. Mm -hmm. And we ask people, what do you need to stop doing where you're undermining yourself? It could be negative self-talk, it could be fear, it could be a belief that God is not there. It could be, you know, there's so many people that even might need to relocate. And, you know, I always try to talk to people about relocation because sometimes it can make all of the difference. And my, we certainly understand why people wouldn't want to relocate. But on the other hand, we can go to the Bible and I always say, is, is there anything in the Bible about people ro relocating? Mm -hmm. And of course there is, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's not where I want to be. It's God, just as you were saying, Doug, where, do you, where does God want me to be? Where is God going to create a new family for me? And open your mind to that because if God needs you somewhere else, I just can't imagine him saying again when you get to the other side, gee, I really wished you'd moved to Los Angeles or Spain or Nebraska. Who knows? Do people move to Nebraska? Oh, you know what? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> if you make comments about Nebraska, I'm out of here. This, this interview is over. <laughs> now, we have 1.7 million people in the whole state. Not very many, no. <laughs> but we have a nuclear power plant. No, two of them. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. And, and to add to what Nick was saying, I think it's important to uh, mention how God really honors action. And this booklet, it, it, it's a very involved process. There were nights where I would come home from the nuclear power plant and I'm drained of energy, but I knew I had to put in two, three hours worth of work to go through these steps to really figure out, you know, my natural talents and abilities and what career path God had in mind for me. And so by taking action, you know, God was saying, okay, Doug, give me something to work with here, you know, do the work and I will open up doors for you as you're doing the work. And I think that's something very important. That, that you know, it, it needs to be said, there, there are certainly people, and I have a couple of children that know today immediately what they want to do with the rest of their life. That happens. Mm -hmm. But there are other people that, you know, in, in your case, uh, I'm, I'm going to probably make him blush a little bit here, but he has the curse of genius. The guy's really mm -hmm. smart. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes that can be used against you because there are so many options out there and so many interests that it's hard to grab onto those. So I, I get told that a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've, seen, I've heard that. Well, <laughs> once. I was told once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Doug, what was some of the, on these tips, what was one that really clicked with you that you felt like you really got some ground to making this decision or discernment? It was, it, I'm not sure what the name of the tip was or what number it is. I'm sure he could tell you <laughs> off the top of his head, but it had to do with passion. It, your earliest uh, memories back as a, as a child, what have you always been passionate about and interest? Where do your passions lie? I, I'm a huge fan of talking. I love asking other people, what are your passions? If you could do anything in the world without having to worry about money, what would that be? And nine times out of ten, they're going to tell you what their passion is. But you know, a lot of people will say, I don't know. And mm -hmm. first impression is they don't know. Mm -hmm. But then you just stay with them and, and you probe the edges of it. And interestingly, stories come out. And with, with Doug, 
I, we went all the way back to, so Doug, what some of the first memories you ever had about passion and, and interests of yours, and you told the story of? Uh, music. Um, and how old were you? Three years old, one of my earliest memories. I, uh, there was a record for uh, a children's movie that had classical music, and I just remember one day staring out the window, listening to this music, and, 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 I, and I, believe God, I believe music is a gift from God. I think it's that it moves the soul and it really prepares the heart for messages. I think that, I think that miracles happen w mm -hmm. with music. And um, anyway, I was listening to this music and it just moved me so much. At three years old, it brought me to tears. Mm. And my mom came out, and I remember this, she said, Doug, what's wrong? And I just made up some story. Oh, I hit my head and I, mm -hmm. oh, you know, and tried to get out of it. Mm -hmm. but. Um, at a very early age, music always mo moved me, and it was it played a huge role in my life and my path, and my right. walk with God. And we have you recorded a song earlier for us today. Can yes. you set that song up for us? Yeah. We're about to play it. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, the song is called um, "Jesus Is His Name," and actually, before I went out to California, I met with my grandmother. Uh, she was a little concerned about me. I was not a practicing Catholic at the time, going to Mass or any of that, uh, but she gave me a medal with a picture of Jesus on it. And on the back was John 14, 6, I think it is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And um, uh, I looked at this thing and I thought, wow, well, great, this is awesome, Grandma. Uh, it's not exactly very good looking, it's kind of gaudy, but I'll wear it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, I wore this and it, it was, uh, there were some real struggles that I encountered, some real challenges, and it was a real dark period out there for me. And um, it didn't work out as I'd hoped, so I drove from California all the way to Washington, D.C. to move in with my younger, more responsible brother. I'm the oldest, that should have been me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, it, it was very humbling. And in, 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 in one night, I was at my lowest point, and I decided to write a letter to God. And I said, God, if you're real, start acting in my life here, you know. And shortly thereafter, things started happening, and I wrote that song. Okay, well, we'll... Uh We'll roll this song by uh, Doug Ebaugh, Jesus. Jesus is his name. Jesus is his name. Yeah. 
to this day I wear that gift in Jesus is his name it's a gift I pride to carry on in Jesus is his name That's great. That's a beautiful song, Doug. Um, Thank you. Now you have you love music, but mm -hmm. today you're not a musician. Can um, you talk about that discernment? Yeah, you know, absolutely. After I mean, you are a musician, but I, you're not professional. Yeah, yeah, it's not my it's not my day job, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so to speak. Um, <laughs> no, after working with Nick in 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 doing some real woods shedding with his hundred plus tips program and a lot of prayer involved, um, came to the conclusion that okay, you need to be in sales, Doug. You're a highly relational chemical engineer that loves working with and inspiring others, and you love challenges that demand a high level of creativity. And, and you love, I mean, little things that came out that became major components is, he, as you can see in his music, he's very sincere. You know, he, he's, he's not slick. I mean, you are slick, but you know, <laughs> Doug's not slick. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm from Nebraska. You're from Nebraska, right? <laughs> so that explains the lack <laughs> of slickness. All right, we gotta send you to New York for a weekend. <laughs> I'll go with you. Okay. <laughs> but you know, he is relational. He is a storyteller. He does have an ability to relate to people. And we drilled down into some of the core competencies because we talked about, again, it's not always that you can make money at, and maybe someday God mm -hmm. will lead him to making money with his music. Mm -hmm. But right now, what gifts did God give you that you can use? And relating to people as an engineer was the set. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just working on engineering. And, that, and those were talents that I, I just took for granted. And I wish I would have been able to recognize that at a younger age. Oh, let's say that. You need to hear this, those of you that are in the audience. The better you are at something, the more likely it is you're gonna be taking it for granted. Doug, you wanna spin off that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always, I've always been able to connect well with people. Um, I'm not bragging or anything by any means, but it, thanks be to God for that talent that he gave me. And, and I have other weaknesses, but I, I always took that for granted. How, how, how is that special, being able to connect with people? Mm -hmm. Well, in sales, that's a very important key aspect to being a successful salesperson. Well, talk, tell, the, tell mm -hmm. the audience about what you just heard in your current job, you're able to. Oh, I, 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 I'm developing a reputation as being a phenomenal prospector, getting in the door that most people can't, where most people can't get into to meet with key clients. Mm -hmm. And being able to connect with people is a vital role in, in being yeah. able to do so. And I, I think this might be the part of the show too where our parents and grandparents breathe a big sigh of relief that we're not giving the message, because I asked you this before the show, right. just do what you love and the money will follow. There's some practical aspect to this. There it's, always is. Yeah. I mean, you need to look at what we call your inner saint, which is a very useful acronym. It's your skills, abilities, your interests, and your natural talents. That came to me, by the way, in the middle of the night. God just gave me that one. It's just like, you know, tell people they're all a saint, and the way to sainthood is to figure out what I've given them. In other words, their gifts. Look at their mission and their purpose, but also look at the economic factor mm -hmm. of how can you put those things together and make right. a living. And mm -hmm. that's what we're doing here with Doug. And you found a, a joy and happiness in using these skills. Y yes. And you're not a, a rock star. No, right? but it's fulfilling work. Uh, I right. enjoy it. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's Back at the plant, I had to, I really had to strain and try harder only to not really get that much further ahead. In fact, sometimes it was like, you know, steps backwards. Mm -hmm. Where here, I have to work hard. I work very hard, but it, it's just a less of a burden. It's it more comes naturally more, who comes you are. It more natural. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rather than surviving, I'm thriving. Right, right. Could you all talk more about practically how do you get to that point to discovering that? those elements that you need to engage in your life? You know, one of the first things I'll say is although we do use career tests, it's not where we start. Mm -hmm. We start with a dialogue and listening to people. And you know, we, we talk in, in many retreats about giving people the opportunity to tell their story. And when people are listened to and they're affirmed, they start giving you bits and pieces that weave together in a mosaic, if you will, that you can piece together. And so you start with the stop. 
you know, and then you go from there. What are you willing? So the stop again is? The stop yeah. is the first step in the process. What are you doing that's undermining yourself? I mean, the mm -hmm. world is tough enough, and I can see several heads in the audience shaking. Everybody knows how we do that to mm -hmm. ourselves. And we have to get a hold of, you know, the, the belief that this isn't going to work out. Right. And believe that, you know, it's again, careers through faith, not careers through fear. Right, okay. Okay. You know, we also look at asking people about their, their mission in life. And again, that's one of those things that happens where people don't really understand that till they take the time to ponder it. Because we're so conditioned to believe that our mission is to make money. And there's nothing wrong with money. You know, we all know that it supports our families, it supports ministries like we have here. But on the other hand, putting the priority first of looking at what is God calling you to do with your life and then expecting that the money needs to be part of it. Mm -hmm. It's also important as you're going through this to think about doing this in a maximized way. It's surprising to me how many people want quick fixes to life altering situations. It just doesn't happen. I worked with Nick, for example. I worked with him in this program for 12 months. It was a year. I needed a quick fix yesterday, as far as I was concerned, when I walked into your door. But, um, you know, it was on God's time, though. And, and I did the work. Things did improve well, for let's me. Let's talk about tip number four in the process, which is turn thought into action. Absolutely. That's one of the things that we did, is that if he was thinking about other careers, to begin to really explore them, to shadow, and to network, and to talk to people that are, are doing those jobs. And, you know, you can only think this through so far. You have to get to the point where you talk to others who are doing the job that you're talking about mm -hmm. and experiencing it or going to take a course in that area and finding out whether you want to go to school or you're dreading going to school. And so you, you, you can think, but then you've got to turn it into action and you will see by the action whether or not you're on the right course. Nick, what do you say to the guys out there who are going through the, you know, the term midlife crisis or maybe more appropriately midlife question. Right. You know, so many years I've done something and now I'm here in my 40s or 50s or wherever you're at, late 30s, 40s, and man, I just, I don't know. I just, that's a, that's a tougher time than, than earlier on in so life. So as you speak, you've run into that too. Yeah. And I do all the time. And, and we actually call that, you know, the golden talents. One of the interesting things that we found is that there are many people that go through that midlife awakening and it's looking at life different, and it's not just about chasing the golden buck, but looking at deploying their talents and serving others, and it awakens thoughts that they weren't having before. And the first thing that you do when working with somebody like that is to validate that it's not just a crisis. Right. It's maybe God is calling you in a different direction. And in, in many of my speeches, I talk about the fact that one of the first people that I worked with was a an architectural professor who at 45 years old was having a midlife crisis, if you will, and he s interpreted it as, what's wrong with me? Where's God? Why am I not happier? And he had all the right tickets punched. He had a Harvard bachelor's, MIT master's, UCLA PhD. He's teaching at a major university, but something wasn't right. And when I talked with him and we took him through this process, what came out is he wanted to be a medical doctor. And he had, interestingly, what's so profound about this, he didn't know. Mm -hmm. And he gave me all of these bits and pieces. And then finally, one, t one day I said, you know, let's just stop talking for a while, read my notes, and I'll be back in an hour. I walked back into the room an hour later, and he looked up at me, and I still get sp uh, chills when I think about this. He looked up at me and said, man, I really want to be a doctor, don't I? And that's what I do, I start to point this out. And at 45 years old, he went back, and here's now you gotta walk the talk. He started volunteering at a hospital. And I asked him, so then a few weeks, a few months later actually, so how's it going? And he said to me, oh, I'm not so sure. And that was kind of painful to hear because I, I thought, okay, we were off here. And so I said, so what was the matter? And he said, well, I'm supposed to work between seven and 9 p.m. every you know, few nights to volunteer. I seldom get out of there till two or three in the morning. Huh. See, he found his passion. He couldn't pull himself away from it. He took some chemistry courses and then studied for the MCATs and did he enjoy it? And the answer is, every step of the way, he began to validate it. You can't always think it through. You have to act it through. Nick, what, what do you say to those people out there, and I, I've run into some like this over the years, who, who are so adamant <laughs> about trying to force a person into 
into a career or into something based on maybe fear, financial security, whatever it may be, that you'll see even, you'll see kids that I think are, are untapped oil reserves. They're, they're filled with, sub, back to this power energy thing again. Mm -hmm. um, now we're on the you know, fossil fuel. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, which doesn't, the disaster rate on those is much, much less than a nuclear yes, meltdown. Yes, you know I mean? Mu much less. Well, much okay, less. It's another, we'll talk after the show. <laughs> but, but there's a lot of parents out there who will, they, they really put a lot of pressure on their kids, and I talk to a lot of kids who, they, they do sem seem to be leaning towards this or that, but they feel this weight of their parents saying, no, you've got to go to school, you've got to get this degree, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. What, what would you say to those out there who are doing the pushing and the pressuring? Let's start with the first tip, stop. And sometimes one of the things that people say to me, I have to stop letting my parents make my career and life decisions. Yeah. And what I would say to them is, you know, let your child grow in God's pattern, in the DNA that he has given them. You know, certainly we have to be economically viable. We, we have to right. think about, and what I call income, I, I, it's, you know, great income can be worthy and wonderful, and a, even somebody that's learned to live on not much can be wonderful, but it has to be sustainable. So make sure we look at a sustainable income, but allow your child to explore their interest. A, a gentleman that I, young man I just got done working with was, was a person that his father was a banker, his brother is a financial advisor, and he thought he was supposed to go to business school, and after two years in business school found out it wasn't where he was supposed to be. And I, I, you know, we kind of calmed down the situation, affirmed that there's something there, listened to him, and what came out was, and this is an amazing story, and these stories happen in front of me, and it just you know, lifts me to want to go help the next person. He wanted to be a comic book artist. And you think, you know, come on, how's somebody going to make a living being a comic book artist? And I looked at some of his work. It was fantastic. So that's the first thing. He has great artist, artist, artistic skills. He knew all the comic book superheroes. So that's part of it. The next part of it is he loves telling stories. He's known amongst his friends as somebody that can weave a story extemporaneously. So he has that gift. Then the next part of it that came through is he just likes spending time with people, and hear this now, evangelizing. And he described it as, I like doing cool evangelizing just hanging out with people and talking about what's going on in their life and demonstrating to them that those incidences in their life are God coincidences and opening their mind up to it. And he wants to use those skills now to evangelize through comic books. Amazing. Now we can look at that and say far-fetched until you think about the animation industry being a billion dollar wow, industry yeah. now. And wouldn't we like to have somebody on our side in that industry rather than somebody that Look at all the heads shaking on that one. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, what a gift. But yet, if he was following the business track, it wasn't the right place. And I'm so excited for him, and I see so much talent in him. And you know what? His parents are now behind them because he's taken the time to explain to them. And we help him to put together a mind map, which is a visual representation of what's going on in his head so you can see it and you see all those pieces and then it begins to make sense, Doug. Let's yeah. talk about it a minute. You said one of the core steps is to get help, not to try to, if you're a young person out there looking for work, trying to discern what you're called to do, to involve some help. You know, I, I was talking to a guy the other day, he was in his 50s, he worked very hard all his life, and all of a sudden he, he wants to do something to give back. And he's kind of burned out with his work too. And I told him, well, you ever think about you know, you have this gift of you can mentor somebody else, give your experience to a young person. What, do you, is that true? What do you see like in that, that group of maybe men out there who have worked real hard and they do have something to offer? How can they to connect with young people? Well, you know, let's start with, you know, the 50s because some people look at the 50s as being, you know, mature and later in life. And when I turned 50, just a year ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, it hit me hard because I thought, you know, maybe I only have 10 or 15 more years left to work. And what I found was is that one night I was complaining to God because I love what I do. I get to do what I do for a living. It's just a wonder that I get to do this and I get paid to, do, to help people. And I was complaining to God, and again, at you know, the middle of the night, God seems to talk to me. It's the only time he can get my attention. And God said to me, and I believe these were words from the Holy Spirit because they just touched me so deeply. Nick, think about living to be 125. And I said, God, you gotta be kidding me. And then that's where fear, and I said, okay, I can't do that. 
you know, maybe if, and then he said, interesting, I said, God, so what if I don't live to be 125? He said, you know what? The rest of your life, no matter what it might be, will stay on track if you're willing to work with me no matter what age you are. So the first thing I would tell those guys in their 50s, are you just getting started or is your mind such that you're beginning to shut it down? Mm -hmm. And I don't think, well, right. let's just put it this way. Uh, Doug, you're a Bible scholar, right? Is there anything in the Bible about retirement? <laughs> well, the retirement plans. When are he great. says Bible yeah. scholars, he's talking about you or me. <laughs> <laughs> Which Doug? <laughs> you know, there isn't. You know, no, there we're, isn't. we're called to serve whenever, and it can be through mentoring. It can be through teaching. I've worked with several people that have gone on to teaching in their fifties, mm -hmm. and that's a way of mentoring. Right. So, you know, it can be a shift that's major. Somebody that's going to reinvent themselves. But the whole thing is, is you know just don't stop at 50 and think about it's over and it's winding down because it will be an obvious self-fulfilling prophecy. Pope John Paul, think right, about it. Right, Till right. the day he died, he was working for us. Right. Die with your boots on. Now we have about yeah. a minute and a half. Any closing thoughts, Doug? Yeah. Um, no, I, I really think that um, kids in particular shouldn't be afraid to really explore you know, what career path or anything in their lives, you know, um, for that matter, what God has in mind for them mm -hmm. and what path they should take. And I think that the earlier that, um, th that kids or high schoolers, college students are encouraged to explore that, the more fulfilling and more uh, mm -hmm. passion-filled mm -hmm. life that, that they're going to lead right. in, in more to more happiness. L let's spin off that for a minute because I do get a lot of questions from people asking what they can do to guide their children and grandchildren. And the first thing is buy a blank journal. And when your children start talking about their dreams and their aspirations and their interests, make note of it. Let them draw a picture so that when they're 18, 19, or 20, they can go back and they can look at the record. And mm -hmm. I, whenever I'm thinking about dreams at that level, I, when I'm writing, I always capitalize it as a divine dream because God can seed in your heart the hope that he has for you. And many times we do find it's very, very early in life. And one night I had a woman that was in one of the classes that I teach and she brought her five-year-old daughter and we were talking about mind maps and what dreams were. And at the end of that, this five-year-old girl put together a, a Crayola mm -hmm. crayon picture of what her dreams were. Absolutely priceless. They were already there in a five-year-old. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. and, You're welcome. Uh, God's got a plan for all of us. And he wants us all to contribute to the kingdom and to serve him, put our talents and energies uh, for that kingdom and to help others get there too. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. May our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We'll see you next week.